This program contains strong adult language, violence, and brief nudity. It's everything you're looking for. Live from the Sims Tower in the Robinson Auto Group studio, we are AM 1600 WKKX. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Whispers Radio here on AM 1600 WKKX, the Valley's Watchdog, and UPRN, the UFO Paranormal Radio Network. It is 43 degrees here in downtown Wheeling. Give us a call, 304-214-1600. If you're out of the area, 1-866-514-1600, and that's toll free. Uh, we got a, a guest today, Miss Lola. Yes, I don't know if you can see him or not. Hey, Nick. Oh, here Hi. we go. Nick decided to join us today. Oh, that's the guest. That's the guest you're talking about. Well, I in the you- studio. Oh, okay. Hi, Nick. He's Hello. like a guest host. He's not going to stay long. He just wanted to pop in for a minute. He missed us a little. A little. You should have missed well, us a lot. A I, lot. I have. Right, I'm Jordan. That's Klein. the only reason I'm oh. here. I know. For me, ah. <laughs> Well, one of us. Yeah, and if I believe that one, he's got some <laughs> swamp land he'll sell me on the island. And I'm Jordan Klein. She's Lola Miller here with uh, Sarah Howard. And, of course, Nick Queen decided to stop on by. Uh, we got a, a different thing we're doing with the show today. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Ernie Hudson, who uh, I don't know if anybody out there has ever seen Ghostbusters or Oz or oh, no. The Crow. You know. What are those? If you've never seen those. <laughs> he's going to be promoting his new show. Uh, are you with us, Ernie? Yep, yeah. How you doing, sir? Yeah, I'm good. Hey, guys. How you doing? It's a pleasure hear- hearing you. Uh, well, it's great to be here. We we are huge fans. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Lola's giggling like a little girl. I am. You're, you got her going. Um, tell us about your new show. It's uh, well, Tra- Transformers Prime, right? Yeah, Transformers Prime, and it's on the Hub Network. I think it's going to premiere uh, February 18th. I don't know if that's well, a couple of Saturdays from now. But, uh, yeah, you know, it takes the, um, you know, Transformers franchise and, um, you know, the, the war between the uh, Decepticons and the Autobots and happening here on Earth for control of the Earth. You know, the, you know for the Transformers fans out there, it's, but it's an exceptionally well-done series. And uh, I play uh, Agent Fowler, uh-huh. the human liaison between the government and... Um, and the uh, the Autobots. So, are you and a bad guy or are you a good guy? You? No, he's a good guy. You know, he's a military, you know, um, guy who's um, you know runs this this program, and he's a little cantankerous and probably should have retired <laughs> ten years ago. And um, but um, really, you know, old school would rather do it all himself. But he knows that he has to depend on the you know the uh, the Autobots and. Um, but 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 at heart a really good guy. But just uh, you know from the John Wayne days, I think. Um, but a fun character, you know, a little uh, you know a little out of shape, a little little past his prime. I don't think they drew it too closely to me. <laughs> no, well, we did. I was you looking know, at but, a picture uh, not uh, just a little bit ago. <laughs> Yeah, I'm looking at this, going, guys. Uh, how much of this is supposedly me? But, um, <laughs> but it's but it's a fun character. Now, uh, what's it like uh, doing the show? Uh, being a cartoon, ha- have you done other voice acting? Yeah, you know, back in the um, before the Ghostbusters, I, I did the uh, the superheroes uh, thing, played a character named Cyborg. And uh-huh. So I've done um, I did some work on the Batman um, animated series. Um, I do um, the Beverly Hills Chihuahua. Uh, two and we just finished Beverly Hills Two Hour Three with George Lopez. Uh, do one of the voices for one of the dogs. So I've done voice work before, uh, but I really love this particular show because some of the guys who are giants in the business, uh-huh. Frank Wal- Walker and oh, yeah. Peter Cullen. I mean, those guys are amazing. And now, uh, what's it like working with know. Peter Cullen? You know, the voice of Optimus Prime. Uh, yeah, no, he's uh, he's just extraordinary. And then, of course, when we're not, you know. Um, you know, working the lines from the show. I mean, he goes into all these impersonations and characters, and I'm amazed at how many voices come out of these guys. Um, but uh, Jeffrey Combs is, is in it. Kevin uh, Richardson, who's extraordinary. So it, I feel like I'm in school. You know, when I, when I go there, it's like, oh, and the great thing about the show is we all come together to do it. Uh, so you're um, all you're all together around microphones. Yeah, we're all there in the room and. Uh, and everybody's down to earth and just very giving, and it's just a lot of fun. That's it. I think it would be harder uh, to do it by yourself, just you know, one person yeah. at a time, because you don't have anybody to play off of. 
Yeah, that's true, especially when you're doing scenes together. I mean, I've done it that way, but it, it is a little harder. And um, But, it, yeah, you do get a – you do vibe off each other. Um, we did a Ghostbuster video game, which turned out really, really great. But, oh, yeah. you know, there was nobody in the room while we were doing it. And so that just makes it – you know, you just sort of have to use your imagination, I guess. And, you know, these guys have an amazing way of pulling that stuff together. But Now, now uh, since, since you brought it up a couple times uh, – what are the chances? <laughs> well, I, I know there's 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 been talk of uh, Ghostbusters three. Yeah, you're you you're know, on board for that, right? You know, yeah, I'm on board. I mean, I'm on board for any job that pays. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm like the least of their concerns. But you know, I don't know why it hasn't happened. I mean, the fans have been just, you know, incredibly supportive. I mean, I was in France uh, just before Christmas. And, you know, people find out I'm in town and, you know, 30, 40 guys show up in their Ghostbuster outfit. <laughs> no, that's got to be flattering. Yeah. You know, yeah, no, it's great. I mean, you know, almost 30 years after the movie, people all over the world, really, Australia, New Zealand, I don't care where I go, there's this, you know, these Ghostbuster chapters. And so that's really kind of cool. And, and they've been waiting for a film, and you want to, you know, it's just this time, but somehow, for whatever reason, and to be honest, I really don't know. Yeah, you know, I, I hear the stuff on the internet, and fans tell me a lot of stuff that they hear. Um, and I've talked to the studios, or they've they've called, even though I saw something on the internet saying that I call every day, which is not true. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, IMDb's uh, got you already as signed uh, up. Uh, yeah, I mean, they well, so. you know, nobody's actually talked to me really, <laughs> you know, but they assume that I'll be the easy, you know. Uh, element to bring in and well in, in a way you you are and, and i know nick and i have talked about this before you you're our favorite you know ghostbuster yeah, that's what i told jordan well, i was like he's the working man's ghostbuster he makes me feel like i could be a ghostbuster <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah if ernie Hudson can do it hey anybody can do it <laughs> <laughs> but i you know I'm, I'm a working actor and that's kind of how i've always approached the business and um i don't know why it's so complicated um, but I know, I mean, I work with the guys and, you know, and the studio. And so I know how they can make any simple thing be a little complicated. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, but I just have the greatest respect and I'd love to see it happen, but you know, I'm not going to wait for it. See, I'm looking at the inside. I'm actually looking at Winston getting in. I'm really want to open a franchise here in Willing. <laughs> you know, be fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. And I think a lot of the, uh, sort of ghost, um, you know, um, searches and all those programs that came out of, you know, the ghost hunts and all that. Um, I think it was really sort of inspired by Ghostbusters, and uh, I have no desire to go hunting for anything personally. But No. Do you have any ghost stories? Because we were just talking before, <laughs> maybe trying to get, like, the president to come on just to tell a ghost, ghost story. Yeah, you know, I think everybody has one. I think sometimes people, you know, unless you're really skeptic. I mean, I, I really believe that, there are other dimensions beyond our five senses. I mean, let's face it, it's like a computer. If it, yeah. You know, there's another not, not program there, you can't really read it, you know. So, But I think there are other things that are impacting our existence that we are unaware of. So do you Whatever think that, that means, do you think yeah. that ghosts are like uh cuz we had somebody on the show before, they believe that uh any time we see a ghost or a haunting it's like bleed through from another dimension. Is that what um, you're meaning? Yeah, you know, well I, I you know, I don't believe in um Okay, this is just my take. Okay. No, that's okay. I, I believe, you know, I mean, when and when it comes to death that we all have to experience, so that's you know, on some day, um, life doesn't end. So yeah, I think you need a body to sort of uh, be in this particular, um, you know, realm. But I think life goes on, and how where that life is and how it manifests and all that, I don't know. So yeah, I think there are a lot of things going on um, around us. Um, well, somehow in, in the entertainment, though, we really can, we focus on the dark side. Yeah. I mean, you know, we see that all the time, and I kind of go, yeah, but, you know, I'd like to see something a little brighter. <laughs> but I guess we had Casper. And yes. Yes. So, I was just going to say, <laughs> Casper was there. But they had Bad Ghost in there, too, didn't they? Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's just kind of uh, big on a lot of the, you know, the death and, you know, horror and stuff. And, yeah. You know, but whatever. I mean, you know, each is own. I'm not. Now, concerned. going off of the Transformers, the other question, you know, of course, Transformers are from another planet. What's your right. take on aliens? Do you think they're real? Or? <laughs> yeah, because... I mean, yeah, you know, what, somebody told me that um, the uh, the intelligent person, you know, you ever hear that thing about the intelligent? It's, it's uh, aliens, and for 
people like me, it's ghosts, you know, but uh, <laughs> we, you know, <laughs> something's going on and uh, that I can't explain. So, uh, you know, I just think there's a, there's, there are other dimensions and there are other things that, um, I mean, I've seen things that I can't explain, you know, certainly when I was a kid. Well, tell, you know, tell us a, a story. What, what's your, your favorite, I guess, ghost story for, that's well, happened to well, you? Well, what, you know, I remember, you know, my mom died when I was three months old, and mm-hmm. I never knew my father. My grandmother raised me, and we lived in this house, and it was always a little weird. And because you got to realize, I grew up in an environment uh, or in a community where a lot of people believed, and these are old people, mostly from the South, and they believed very strongly that there were ghosts. But, um, but when I got to be about five or six or seven eight, maybe, I don't know, um, my grandmother, who would um, go to church all the time, she would leave me and my brother, um, and my brother's a little older, so he would sort of, was there to take care of me, but uh-huh. then as soon as she left, he would sort of take off and go hang out with his friends, so I was alone in the house, and I always hear this sort of moving around, up, you know, the upstairs, the sounds, it would always kind of freak me out, and um, and so, you know, and I would run out of the house, and I'd kind of, you know, be afraid, but... um and then we had these, this this stairway, and I could hear. Um, one day, I decided just uh, I wasn't going to run. I'm going to stay here. There you go. And and I heard the, the the sound came to the stairs, and it was like hanging there for a while, and then it started coming down the stairs. <laughs> oh, and then and I totally freaked, and I, mean, I just I ran out of the house. And then when I ran out, I turned around and looked back, and at the top of the stairs there was a window. Yeah. And there was a woman in the window, <laughs> looking out, and and I just. I just kind of lost it, and then she wasn't there. But then oh. I was afraid to go back in the house because I knew somebody was in there, even though, you know, my grandmother and everybody was saying there was nobody there. And they went to the house and they said, "Look and see," and they opened all the closets and everything. And how long but did I it knew take you? I saw somebody. I, I knew I saw somebody, and, it, and I just—I mean, it—it it, um, it was about a, about a week or so with people trying to convince me, and then my grandmother sat me down and said that uh, my mother was always looking over me and mm-hmm. that that was her and that she didn't mean me any harm and that if it made me really uncomfortable that the last thing she'd want to do is to frighten me and a lot of times people don't have experiences because they really can't handle it well that's good that, 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 that's yeah. the lighter side of the 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 ghosty world i guess yeah and well, i never a smart uh, grandma. i never saw her again but you know what i'd love to have a visitation now i mean i you know i you know now i think i can uh, I'm a little older, you know, um, but then it was it was really really, and I can still I can still see see her face in that window. Wow! Mm. See, um, you and I are the same. I I so desperately want to see something, anything, touch yeah, me, yeah. poke me, push me right. downstairs. <laughs> I don't. I'm to the point because we've been doing all these ghost hunt things, right? And everybody else is going. Wow! Did you hear that? Did you see that? No, no, right. and no. No, Lola, Lola's the one that stands out in the field, like with a sign that says "abduct me." It's like, come on! Right. Yeah, <laughs> and, well, and yeah. nothing ever happens. Right? Yeah, you know, I think you you do have to be receptive to the possibility. You're really open, and um, but yeah, but I tell you, there is a time, there is a space, and I get this all the time, even now. They, just before sleep, and I don't know what that that in between you're not asleep yeah you're That's laying there in bed yeah. your eyes are closed when i would get i get like someone crawling in bed with me i get you know wow. something touching me i mean do you ever, do you get that uh, no. <laughs> no you're, you're <laughs> begging for you're begging for some kind of experience and you got something crawling in bed with you <laughs> yeah no i i think it's um you know it, i i can that astral traveling where you uh-huh. really feel separating from your body and getting yeah. up and and looking back, and you can see yourself laying in bed there, and you can walk, and I walk through the house. That happens. Wow. Huh. Yeah, that that happens actually quite a lot, and wow. it used to kind of freak me out because I would panic thinking I couldn't get back into my body. That's what my um, fear would be. Would be what know, if yeah, I get like, lost? That's right. Somewhere. What if I'm stuck yeah. out here and 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 Ernie Hudson is laying in bed there, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm stuck in the hallway. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Not good. No, but, um, no, no, no. That's kind of like uh, what was the movie that just came out? Insidious. Is that is that it? Where they have you seen that? I, I, well, what happened in the movie? It, it's kind of like towards the end, the guy guy does the astral projection type of deal, and he travels, and they're like, "Well, if you go too far, you're not going to find home." You know? <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, you know that that cord that sort of you know attaches you. That, yeah. Uh, 
So, yeah, so I, I've, I've had those experiences, but then I go, well, maybe I was actually asleep and didn't know it. You know, mm-hmm. or, or here's, here's one that happens uh, quite a bit, too. I can, I can um, sort of lay there, and, you know, I'm thinking about getting up, and I always sort of do this sort of plan in my head what's going to happen. And then I'll reach up, and I'll, like, sort of rub my face, and, you know, um, and then I open my eyes, and my hands are laying down by my side. Wow. And I'm touching, and it's not, it feels like my hands, but it's not. And I have to almost shake my body to get it to snap into place. Hmm. I've had creepy. that a lot. Wow, <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know. You know it's like, uh, so. Um, now, is, is, yeah. there a way, is there a way we can uh, give you our email address, and that way we can schedule you for a, a longer interview? Sure, yeah, absolutely. The, um, well, you know, you can always reach me, too, at uh, Ernie-Hudson.com. I think there's a, it is a, uh, an email there, but I'm going to write yours down. Okay. And, um, you know, yeah, but, uh, I, you know, I'd love to talk to you guys anytime. Yeah, because we got another guest on that's, that's going to be coming on, and I, I really enjoy We're getting into Wait. some deep stuff. I didn't know that you had this much going on, Ernie. Oh, well, you know, I don't... Um Talk about yeah, it much? I, I, well, yeah. I mean, because first off, people who don't believe, they think you're crazy. Yeah. You know, and the, yeah, and we the get people, that a lot. <laughs> the people who do believe, I think they're crazy. So <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of hard to get that happy medium, you know? Yeah. All right, Ernie, here's, here's some very important things. I know right. you went to school at Wayne State. I grew up right. just outside of Detroit. Oh, wow. Okay. So, um, yeah. I drove 19 and a half hours to see the Lions at, yeah, in uh, New Orleans. You know, oh, for, oh, wow, okay. So yeah. I want to know, my family wants to know, are you still, or were you ever, a Lions, Red Wings, Pistons, and Tigers fan? Well, Uh-oh. you know. I'm, not- <laughs> I'm going to be disappointed, aren't I? Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm probably closer to ghosts than I am with most uh, sports teams. I mean, I, I don't really, because I've always had kids, and I they have so little time. I watch the Super Bowl and I watch, you know, the you know, the playoffs and all that stuff, but uh I just never really I've always had kids since I was like nineteen, so I've just very hard to kind of uh, really get into a lot of the sports stuff. Well see I figured you know. with the Lions, I'm getting old now and they finally made it to the playoffs. It could yeah. be a once in a lifetime occurrence for me. So <laughs> I, I had to go. I had to go. Yeah, no, and it was great. It's um you know, I mean, when I went to Wayne State, I was working two jobs. I had two kids. You know, when I finished up, I got a scholarship to Yale, and then they gave me enough money where I could actually just focus on school. Yeah. But no, when I was in Detroit, it was well, – I love Wayne because it's one of those I schools where you can really – you know, but I, I had to to support my family and do everything, so I didn't have a lot of time to play. There was a little bar on Cass called That New Joint. I Oh, that. yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm on the alumni board, so I go back there at least three times a year and uh, and try to help out. And, uh, you know, when that big fundraiser we had, I hosted a number of events for them, so I, I try to help as much as I can. Yeah, I love that campus. You know, yeah, it's great. It's great. And it's, I think it'll it'll help save Detroit. I had too. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah. Okay. Let, let me give you our email address. It's whispers w h i s p e r s, right? One six zero zero. Okay. At gmail dot com. Gmail. Okay. Now, and where are you guys? Um, uh, we broadcast out of Wheeling, West Virginia. Oh, West Virginia. Okay. okay. Sure. Super. All right. Yeah. I'll. Uh, you know, I'll send you my information there, and uh, anytime, just give me a call. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll hook up something so we can have a longer interview and really get into some of this stuff. Okay, I'd love to. Hey, Ernie, thank you very much. Uh, All right, guys. Uh, Agent yep. Fowler for Transformers Prime, February 18th, 8.30 a.m., 5.30 uh, a.m. Eastern Time, 5.30 Pacific. Uh, don't miss it. Don't miss it. It's a great show. There you go. Thanks, Ernie. Thanks, Ernie. All right, guys. Take Good care. Good to you. See Bye-bye. ya. That's exciting. <laughs> All right, and our next guest, do we need to take a break first, or we can we yeah, go? Yeah, we should. Yeah, and you talk to him in the break. You think you can do that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, All right. No you're listening confidence to, over there. I you're listening to Whispers <laughs> Radio. We're going to be right back after the short break. Behind everything you're searching for is something you're actually looking for. Something more than the page you flip to or the words you type into a search bar. For example, 
When you search with the real Yellow Pages, you get more than just a landscape contractor. You slow down the neighborhood traffic with a whole new curb appeal. It's not just getting step-by-step directions to a dry cleaner with great reviews on YP.com. It's rescuing that forgotten favorite from the back of the hallway closet. And it's more than finding the closest 24-hour locksmith with YP.com on your mobile. It's the satisfaction of getting to sleep in your own bed. Dreams realized, challenges big and small conquered, memories in the making. No matter what you're looking for, it all starts with a search. And there are more ways to search and more ways to find exactly what you're looking for with the real yellow pages, yp.com, and yp.com on your mobile, only from AT&T. BC Tonight, a castle event, 60 years in the making. A private dick. If I'm anything, I'm discreet. A mobster's dame. So what's your name, tough guy? Does it matter, doll? Their scandalous attraction. I hate wise guys eyeballing my girl. Could put them on ice. <laughs> You've never seen Castle like this. Well, where have you been all my life? Castle is all new, following The Bachelor on ABC. Tonight on WTRF, ABC Ohio Valley. Blood. Dry spell. Heat wave. Blizzard. Rough weather. Affects your commute. Up to date. Weather forecasting. Track the system. Predictor. Storm tracker 7. Live Doppler radar. Seven day forecast. Accurate. You get your weather forecast first. WTRF CBS. Fox Ohio Valley. ABC Ohio Valley. Both local newscasts. WTRF.com. First with the weather. We keep you ahead of the storm. Affects our viewers. Affects you. A message from Paul Associates Insurance and Real Estate. Because insurance is a must. Calling someone you can trust. State Auto. A friend you can depend on. Are you getting your money's worth from your auto and homeowner's insurance? Maybe you're not so sure of the answer and are interested in finding out. If so, here's a suggestion. Before you renew your present policies, contact your nearby independent agent representing the state auto insurance companies. Compare the benefits state auto has to offer, broad coverages, competitive rates with a host of attractive discounts, and the caliber of service you would expect from a friend you can depend on. So please remember, policy renewal is a good time to check with State Auto. State Auto, a friend you can depend on. For the best in auto and homeowners insurance, call your State Auto Company's agent, Paul Associates Insurance and Real Estate, 233-3303. Don't carry the basement blues into the new year. That wet basement, musty odor, ugly mold growth, and those bowed and buckle walls aren't going away. Without action, the problem will get worse. Engineered Foundation Solutions, a local family-owned and operated company, can help chase those blues away. Take advantage of our off-season discount program by signing up now and scheduling your repairs before the spring rains aggravate your problem. Why should you call Engineered Foundation Solutions? Using acclaimed products and procedures, our licensed engineers and trained technicians can expertly diagnose your problem and provide a quality solution. So call the licensed engineers and get our stamp of approval. Cheer up and leave the blues to BB King. Call Engineered Foundation Solutions at 304-243-9900. Happy New Year from Engineered Foundation Solutions. If you have cancer, you have hope. Hope because of Wheeling Hospital's Schiffler Cancer Center. It's because of the highly skilled and experienced team of oncologists, nurses, therapists, and researchers found there. And it's reassuring that the region's only accredited comprehensive cancer program is at Wheeling Hospital. That means our Schiffler Cancer Center treats far more patients than any other area hospital. What's more, we're the region's only cancer center performing cancer research and providing clinical trials. Our Schiffler Cancer Center has the latest technologies and treatment options, and we're known worldwide. We've treated patients from 36 states and 14 foreign countries. If you have cancer, you also have hope. That's because of the experience, dedication, and compassion found at the Schiffler Cancer Center. We'll take good care of you. We're not just another local hospital. We're the only local hospital with an accredited comprehensive cancer program. Wheeling Hospital. A tradition of excellence, a legacy of caring. Hi, my name's Bob. Hi, Bob. 
I see this ad on TV says I can reduce my debt by 50%. I call, they told me to stop paying my bills, stop talking to my creditors, they'd take care of everything. I gave them thousands, but most of it went to their fees. Getting out of debt is neither quick nor easy. There are those who will tell you anything to win your trust. I'm more in debt now because the fees and interest in my cards kept piling up. Talk to your creditors directly or to find a nonprofit agency near you. Visit debtadvice.org. This has been a public service message. With no artificial news and opinions, WKKX is simply a radio station with great talk. AM 1600 WKKX, the Valley's watchdog. Valley tested, listener approved. Give us a call and tell us what you're thinking. Locally, 304-214-1600. Out of the area, toll free, 866-514-1600. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Whispers Radio here on AM 1600 WKKX, the Valley's Watchdog, and UPRN, the UFO Paranormal Radio Network. It is 633, 42 degrees here in downtown Wheeling. Give us a call, 304-214-1600. If you're out of the area, 1-866-514-1600. Tonight, our guest is Dr. Stephen Browdy. Uh, He is the professor and program chair of the philosophy department at the University of Maryland. Uh, Are you with us, Dr. Browdy? Well, hello. I should correct one thing. I'm now oh. retired. So, oh, you uh, retired? I am. I'm living in Las Vegas. So this is Ruh, ordinarily wow. <laughs> this is ordinarily time for my power nap. So I can't promise I'm going to be uh, um, all that lucid, but we'll give it a shot. Hey, <laughs> congratulations! Well, thank you. It feels pretty good. <laughs> now, when did you retire? Um, over the summer. No. Oh, well, congratulations. Enjoy it. You, Thanks. You doing much travel? You moved to Vegas. I did. It's my, <laughs> actually, it's my hometown. I was born here. Oh, is it? So it's a little bit like returning to the scene of the crime. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you've had a fun week, too, with all those presidential candidates out there. Uh, well, it was exciting, yes. Was it really? No. I bet they'd drive, <laughs> they would drive me crazy if they were around for a full week. It's a big city. You can, you can go places and not see them. <laughs> yeah, go into any casino because nobody but Newt can get away with going into those. Well, you, you keep in mind there are two kinds of casinos. There are those on the Strip and then there are those for locals. Ah. Really? So you guys don't oh, yeah. even go to the... No, you don't go the to the Strip, names. do you? Uh, well, actually, I think the Strip is a lot of fun, but there are times when it pays to stay away. <laughs> <laughs> With me, it's every night, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, before we talked a little bit about, because uh, we had you on a while ago, right. we talked about psychokinesis. Right. Uh, can we get into that a little bit again? Sure. What did you have in mind exactly? Or didn't you? I didn't. <laughs> I just broad topic it. I said psychokinesis. That's what we're going to talk about. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, is there is what there usually what are, usually interests me most about psychokinesis or PK is the, the large scale phenomena. There there are basically two kinds of evidence for psychokinesis. One is uh, sort of standard laboratory demonstration or attempt to demonstrate PK by, for example, trying to influence the output of a, a random event generator. So it's kind of like electronic or some other sort of uh, coin flipping. And the evidence for laboratory PK is usually statistical or quantitative in nature to see to what extent the results uh, are above chance, if they are at all. What interests me more and is the large-scale stuff, like objects flying around or materializing or dematerializing. Now, have you ever seen that? Oh, yeah. Now, I think uh, last time we talked, was it the gold leaf lady? Am I saying that right? Yes. Okay. Um, the gold leaf lady is probably the most interesting case I've ever investigated, although there are a few contenders. But um, this is a woman in Florida whose body would spontaneously erupt in what looked like a golden foil. And I could be sitting just a, a foot or two feet away from her when this happened. It was clear she wasn't applying it to her body. It would just instantaneously appear there. And quite a few people have seen the same thing. So that would be an example of the kind of large-scale psychokinesis that, that interests me. And the reason that kind of thing interests me is that the, the more laboratory, quantitative sort of evidence is just never convincing to anybody. I uh-huh. mean, not even to other parapsychologists necessarily. And... Usually the significance uh, that's attained in these statistical tests is relatively small. I mean, the odds against chance may be millions or billions to one, but the effects are small. So it could be 53% hitting when um, 
50 would have been expected by chance. Now, if you have enough runs in a trial, that can be statistically significant, but it, it's not very viscerally exciting. So by contrast, you know, a table floating through the air slowly and gracefully in bright light with plenty of time to examine it while it's happening, that poses a more clear-cut kind of challenge. And it's also something you can video record. Yeah. Have, you, have you ever seen anything like that? Uh, yeah, I've seen tables go up in the air. That's, that's actually what got me into this many years wow. ago. It was my own table. It was in my house. It was broad daylight. And um, it scared the hell out of me, actually. I didn't know anything about parapsychology at the time, but some, <laughs> friends, some friends came over. It was a sl- I was in graduate school, and it was a slow day in Northampton, Massachusetts. And um, my buddies and I had seen the only movie in town, and they said, well, let's, <laughs> let's play this game called Table Up. And what they meant was, let's have a seance. And I didn't know anything about psychical research, and frankly, neither did my friends. But they'd played what they thought was this game a few times, and they said, when it works, it's really a lot of fun. So for the next three hours, I watched my table move up and down and uh, spell out answers in response to questions. Now, you know, I know there's no way I can describe this so that it would be absolutely compelling to uh, just somebody listening. But I can tell you, again, that it was broad daylight, it was my table. My friends were not practical jokers. I'm not even sure they had a sense of humor. <laughs> and um, if one of us left to leave the room, left the room to go into the kitchen, for example, the, the table would continue to rise under our fingers. And so it wasn't like pressure on the table that was making it go up. We could be standing next to it, and so our knees weren't lifting it. So to me, it was very compelling. And I didn't really know what to do with it, and I literally put it out of mind until I finished my dissertation and got a job and got tenure. And then after you got that, it was then no holds barred. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, at that point, I realized that if I was really an honest uh, philosopher, I, I needed to think about the strange thing that had, had happened to me back in grad school. And I knew that some famous philosophers had taken psychical research seriously enough to write about it. So I read what they had to say and decided that it was really something worth sinking my philosophical teeth into. And then I decided if I was going to be a responsible scholar, I needed to become a a member of the community of scientists and academics who were really up to date on the latest issues and the data so that I could do a responsible job of this. And I guess I've succeeded at that. I'm past president of the Parapsychological Association. I edit the Journal of Scientific Exploration. So I'm pretty much as much of an insider as you can be in this particular community. How did the college uh, respond to what you were doing? Um, Pretty much the way academics do. Fortunately, my department was generally pretty supportive, but I had tenure. So the only way I was going to be fired would be if I had raped the sheep in front of my students. (laughs) <laughs> and frankly, that, that well, you know, at least you know your limits. That's <laughs> so, so I took a lot of abuse for it. I've taken a lot of abuse and have been pretty much professionally marginalized by a good portion of the philosophical community. But um, I have immunity, and so that's the beauty of tenure. Um, so I've dealt with it as best I can. You know, it, in a way, I've actually liked that aspect of it. It's a little bit like getting a divorce. You find out things about people. And so <laughs> I've, I've had some surprises. You know, some people whom I expected to be open-minded and intellectually courageous uh, surprised me by their intellectual cowardice and their, really? their rigidity. And other people whom I expected to be uptight and um, resistant to this surprised me with their open-mindedness. So... I feel as if I've had a much clearer picture of a lot of my colleagues in philosophy as a result of this. And even though some of the revelations were painful, I think basically it's a good thing. Now, is uh, psychokinesis, is that something that anyone can do? I know you said you you and a bunch of buddies were making a table float. Now, is this something that you got to, I guess, be born into? or? That's one of the big outstanding mysteries in parapsychology. I think we don't know. I think we don't know whether... Um, Psychic abilities generally are are things like athletic or artistic abilities, which are unevenly distributed a, amongst the population, or whether psychic functioning is something that happens under the surface and more or less involuntarily to basically everyone, like uh, pulmonary functioning or gastrointestinal functioning. And maybe the, the real psychic superstars in that case would be people like yogis who can control 
processes like vasoconstriction and vasodilation, which most people can't control consciously. So the, the psychic superstars, the people who get known for their psychic uh-huh. abilities, are people who just can control what we're all doing all the time, but presumably unconsciously. And I don't think we don't really know. That's one of the, the main mysteries still. Now, have you done any research kind of on uh, poltergeist? Um, Be- because I know there's some kind of connection, you know, that, you know, it's really the little girl, you know, making the window crack, crash and, you know. I've done some. The cases are not all that easy or rewarding to investigate for somebody like me because unless you've got – because you go to these places where the phenomena are happening and unless – they're happening more or less reliably and regularly. You could spend a lot of time sitting around waiting for something to happen. And, you know, it may not come as a surprise to you that the University of Maryland didn't have provisions in its philosophy department budget for paranormal case investigation. So, <laughs> um, so I usually had to wait for a grant, or uh, I, was, I would sometimes ride on media's coattails or... Um, I would pay for it out of my own pocket. So, did you I, have I like tried. a group, like a bunch of kids wanting to? You know. Oh, always, yeah. <laughs> but um, actually, the gold leaf lady is like a poltergeist case. Really? See, look, the 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 thing about poltergeist cases is that we usually assume that the the so-called poltergeist agent is a teenager or adolescent, and usually they are. I mean, and the idea is that at least the received view of poltergeist is that the agent is somebody with unresolved and usually pretty deep emotional issues and no conventional way to express them. And so the idea is that the poltergeist phenomena are an explosion of these pent-up feelings that can't come out in more conventional ways, and so things shatter or fly across the room or what have you. But, of course, it's not just teenagers or adolescents who have emotional problems, and marriages are fertile ground for these, as I can personally attest. (laughs) Me too. um, and so Katie, the gold leaf lady, is somebody who, although she has lots of psychic abilities, didn't discover any of them until her second marriage, which by all accounts is a difficult marriage. And initially, after she got married, she had lots of poltergeist-like things happening. Really? So objects, were, objects were moving around and appearing and disappearing. And one day, so the story goes, uh, a carving set appeared out of nowhere and then her husband said to her, well, what good is it if it isn't money? And then two days later, her body started to break out in what looks like gold leaf. So if you want my pop psychological analysis of that, it's that symbolically this allowed Katie to satisfy her husband's demand for something valuable, but she didn't really have to bear the responsibility of being the goose that laid the golden egg. you know. And not only that, but because it's a difficult marriage and because I think Katie had lots of uh, pent up anger toward her husband. It's one way of expressing her rage against her husband because she wasn't really giving her husband what he wanted. He wanted something valuable, and she was giving him fool's gold. It's a way of giving him the psychic finger. <laughs> <laughs> I like this lady. Yeah, have you she's done, actually a great person. Have you done any work with spontaneous human combustion? Um. No, I'd be interested to do that. I'm not quite sure how to go about it because you pretty much just see the ashes after yeah. the fact. <clears throat> true, true. There was a great joke in The New Yorker. I don't know if you ever saw this. There's a, a picture of a, a woman standing looking at a pile of ashes on a chair, and she's got this angry look on her face, and she's saying, so now all of a sudden you're Mr. Spontaneous? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's a good one. Now, uh, you would think that uh, spontaneous human combustion would be some ter- some sort of uh, you know psychic you know psychokinesis type of deal because you doing it right. Is well, it that something... would be that, that would be one interpretation of it. I, I suppose there are other options. I mean, I don't know whether there's some sort of physiological mechanism that um, might produce such intense heat that something like that could happen. I really don't know. Okay. I don't even know. Don't even ask where that came from. I, we were just talking, and, and it popped into my head. So <laughs> it tells you a little bit about where my head's at. Well, I think it's an interesting phenomenon. I just I don't pretend to. I mean, look, there are lots of mysterious phenomena that I haven't yet had time to uh, uh, to look into in any detail. But hopefully, that's going to be one of the beauties of retirement. Now, are you uh, going to get into more investigating? Uh, broaden your your horizons now that you don't have to rely on the college? Well, I hope to get busy doing things that I was too busy to do before. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, 
I've been investigating a, a spiritist group in Germany uh -huh. um, <laughs> that produces all sorts of unusual physical phenomena, the kind that we were getting lots of at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, spiritualist phenomena, like not only table levitations, but ectoplasm coming out of the mouth of the medium. Really? And I've been video recording some of this in infrared, and I'm hoping to be able to uh, video record some of it in uh, uh, normal light uh, sometime over the summer. Now, does any of that, like, scare you? You know, you're over in a foreign country, you got your camera, and all of a sudden this goes on? Well... Maybe I've seen too many movies. Um, yeah, it's not that scary. It's, uh, it's kind of gross, but... Um, no, it's not scary. I mean, one of the reasons is that I've gotten to know the people who are involved in the spiritist circle, and, you know, they're great people. So um, I'm comfortable with them. They're comfortable with me. It's just a matter of holding the seances and seeing what happens. You know, objects are moving around in the dark, and sometimes you get startled when you get touched. But uh, um, no, it's not scary. When I was in Key West, well, it's almost two years ago now, a year and a half ago, we did just, you know, one of your ghost tour things, but it ended up in an old house that has, it's got a bar in it, but we were in a room with several other people, and I, they were doing something with crystals and, and stuff, but everybody was, they, they encouraged everyone to snap photos all the way through it, and one of the pictures that one kid got on his digital camera was the man was sitting there, and he was only two people away from me, so he was right next to me, and naturally, I didn't see anything. But out of his mouth was coming like a red mist. Now, Ooh. nobody saw it, but it was on that picture. And no one, you know, you couldn't figure out. Other people were taking pictures at the same time, and there wasn't, I, I don't know how that could have happened. But that was one of the really... Freaky things when, you know, talking about ectoplasm and, and well, yeah, people. Well, yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. There Again, were some great pictures that came out of that tour, that's for sure. One of the problems with stuff like that is that um, you can never be absolutely sure where the effect is coming from. I mean, we know that people have had the ability, like Ted Sirius, to um, produce images uh, coming out of a camera. So... When you're getting physical phenomena on film or video recording, um, it's never exactly clear whether you're recording something that was objectively out there in the world or, or what. I mean, one of the things I do on my case investigations, I, first of all, I take 3D cameras with me and use them whenever possible because if I get um, complementary images on uh, both of the stereo pictures, then that's I'm more inclined to think that I was getting something out there in the world. Mm -hmm. And, um, in fact, there have been some great investigations of physical mediums done with stereo cameras. So there are stereo pairs of photographs of uh, uh, tables flying through the air. Now, wh how often, I don't want to say this because, you know, you research it, so you, you kind of seek it, but how often does something, you know, in these lines where, you know, you have tables and chairs and all that kind of stuff floating around, how often does that actually occur? You know, I don't know. I think um, it occurred uh, apparently fairly often at the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries. I think a lot of it has to do with the mood of the culture, whether it's the sort of thing that, first of all, people feel comfortable with, people are inclined to try to make happen. My guess is that if more people were holding seances and were doing so in the right kind of frame of mind, you might see lots uh, of reports of this sort of thing. As for how often it happens spontaneously, I doubt that it happens spontaneously a lot okay. because we, we'd be, we would be getting reports of that. Okay, it well, may be, go ahead. Uh, my, my thought here is, you know, with seances, you're kind of trying to summon, I guess, a spirit from the other side where psychokinesis I always took is you're doing it with your mind. Well, um, but when you're holding a seance, again, you don't know whether the physical phenomena, if you're getting them, are coming from the alleged entity you're trying to communicate or from one or more of the people seated around the table. And I think in many of the cases there's reason to think it's coming from around the table. I mean, there was a, a very famous experiment done in the 1970s in Canada. Do you know about the... Philip experiment? No. Oh. Uh, the Toronto Society for Psychical Research um, was conducting some 
seances trying to reproduce the kind of table movements that some British researchers have been reporting. And they, they were reporting that they were getting good results when the people sitting around the table just had a very jocular and relaxed frame of mind. They would sing songs, tell jokes. They weren't investing themselves too much in success or failure. So they, they weren't worried about succeeding or, or, or screwing up. And um, so what the, the Toronto group decided to do was to create a fictional character whom they called Philip. They gave him a uh-huh. history. And they spent a lot of time learning Philip's history. This, I, th- I forget if he was a 17th or 18th century nobleman. I, I, think was, I, I think I remember hearing something like that. Okay, so they created this character, Philip. They spent a lot of time immersing themselves in Philip's story, and then they tried to communicate with Philip at a seance. And they, they got wrappings in the table as answers to questions. They got dramatic table movements, which were filmed by uh, Canadian television. And they were communicating with the entity Philip, so it seemed, and um, the, the entity was giving the correct answers. And when they asked the question that the group wasn't sure how to answer, the response was very faint. When they asked the question that the group was certain how to answer, the response was very strong. Wow. Well, so, you get a question. So this lo- yeah, this looks like PK by committee. Yeah. And what it shows, among other things, is that you don't really know what's going on at a seance where you're attempting to communicate with the deceased. For all you know, um, you're, doing you're it really just tapping into the group mind. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that reminds me of something that was told to us about a hotel in Hollywood, I think, or out in California. And it was the same premise. They came up with a story about a ghost and, a uh, you know, that was a woman and she was murdered and you see her in this mirror. It, di- it, it was not true, but pictures came out with this, you know, with this image in it. Uh, people reported, you know, sightings and EVPs and all this, and yet the story wasn't true. And that was the other thing, I think, on the Queen Mary. There, they came up with a story as to just enhance the ghost hunt about a little kid that died. And sure enough, people have this experience. So it, it begs to say, you know, is it really manufactured in your head? And like you said, you know, like by committee, or is there really something there? If you can, you know, get so many people concentrating on one specific thing, can you make it happen psychically, even though that's all it is, that there's, there's, I'm not expressing myself well. Well, no, I get it. And and there's no real way to know. And that's one of the the frustrating things. It's not as if you can go around with a PK meter and just figure out where the influence is coming from. And that's why it's hard to conduct an actual controlled experiment in psychokinesis or in parapsychology. Well, we've got um, Hank is on the phone. He'd like to ask you a question. Go ahead, Hank. Hi, Hank. Hi, I'd like to ask your guest, um, when you were doing some of your photography, have you ever... Uh, taken a photo and captured the orbs that you hear about on some of these uh, paranormal normal shows? I, I haven't, but I think that's because I, first of all, hello? What? Well, somebody, uh, was it something I said? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that was. I, ha- hmm. I haven't gotten the orbs, but I think that's because, first of all, I changed my lenses. Wow. I don't and, and secondly, because I tend not to take pictures in uh, dusty rooms. So I, I, think, I don't think the orbs are especially impressive. I think there are lots of normal explanations for the orbs. If you'd like to make a call. Okay. I guess we lost him. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know what that was. It sounded like somebody was trying to call over top of another line. Well, it was exciting. Yeah, well, <laughs> Is that him? Oh, okay. Uh, when you, how do I want to say, you say you don't do investigations where there's dusty or anything like that? Well, no, I have investigated in, in dusty places, but I, I tend not to take photos in, in lots of dust. So I think often the orbs are uh, are just close-up photograph dust particles. Darn it, because that's, <laughs> that's all I ever capture on my on my cameras are orbs. So I, t- I, I want to believe that they're real because that's all I ever see. So, 
Well, there may be. Uh, look, I'm not ruling out that there may be interesting causes of the orbs too. But uh, um, since I never get them, but have seen plenty of PK, um, I'm more inclined to think that there's uh, a normal explanation for those particular things. Well, see, with the orbs now, I've got a lot that, like when we do the West Virginia Penitentiary tours, you know, you get a lot of those in right. pictures there. We were out. There is one picture. In particular, we were out in the yard, and it was pitch black, and I just I just snapped, just, you know, aimed the camera and snapped. And instead of an orb like you usually see that's kind of transparent and, you know, you can almost see a nucleus in it, this was a bright white pinpoint of light. Now, hmm. That one, I want to. I really want to believe that it's real because <laughs> I mean there was nothing there to have have done that. And I checked to make sure there wasn't anything metal on the ground where the flash could have reflected back off of, you know that kind of thing. In fact, it was it was too high. It wasn't on the ground. Well, so, I certainly believe that you can get photos of things that we are not normally aware of, and that sometimes photography is a way of um, picking up things that we're just missing. So I'm, I'm certainly open to that. But I think we have to be very careful about um, some of the things that people take to be evidence of the, of the paranormal. Well, I know there was one picture I took, and I thought, oh, look at this. This looks like a ghost wafting in the corner. You know what it was? Cigarette smoke. <laughs> it was uh-huh. it's like, darn it. <laughs> Good. That's a good example of the kind of thing I had in mind. Right? Well, only to me. You know, I mean, that kind of stuff happens to me all the time. So. Well, may you strike gold, no pun intended, uh, given that we were talking about the gold leaf lady. But Thank you, good Doctor. Luck. Thank you. <laughs> now, do we have another call? No, or? that's John waiting with the basketball okay. game. All right. Well, we are out of time, right? Well, we got it about three minutes. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Oh, my clock said 7 o'clock. Sorry about that. No, we got we got more time, Stephen. Okay. Uh, Did he had a caller? No, the, no it's, it was it's our the, boss. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> we, we have a basket, girls' basketball game coming up after this. So. Now, the Gold Leaf Lady. Uh, apparently, you've written a, you've written a book, correct? Uh, yes, that's the uh, the title of the book, The Gold Leaf Lady and Other Parapsychological Investigations. That's one of five books I've written. Uh, have you ever had any experiences as uh, unique, I guess, as hers, where it's actually affecting the body in that way? Oh, no, that case is unprecedented, as far as I know. I, um, I've never encountered anything quite like that, and as I explain in the book, it's, it's not clear even how to classify the phenomenon, whether it's a, a materialization or an apport, for example, something that's moving from one place and appearing on her body. I, it looks like it's coming out of her body, but I don't believe it is, be, for two reasons. First, um, because it's, it's actually brass and not gold. She'd really? Have to have, she'd have to have lethal amounts of copper and zinc in her system. And secondly, uh, medical tests never show any anomalies that suggest she has high levels of metal in her system. And thirdly, sometimes the foil appears on her clothing and on objects around the room. So it looks like it's just spontaneously appearing in places, mostly on her body. And um, that leaves a mystery. You know, where is it coming from? And it is actually copper. Uh, Brass. Press, yes. sorry. So it's copper and zinc. What, happen, what happens to it if, when it appears on her body? It d- sticks around. So it, it, unlike regular or normal so-called materializations, they don't later de- dematerialize. So I have quite a lot of the stuff. That's how I know what it is. I've been able to have it analyzed and examined very carefully. Wow. So we just scrape it off her body. Wow. She said her septic tank is filled with it. She takes showers and gets it off in the morning. Now, is she still married to that guy? I think so. Last I heard, she... I mean, it's a very difficult marriage. Yeah, she's still married. Yeah. I won't go into the details. I I would just be curious to see if... If it continues? Yeah. Not necessarily if if they divorced, because then, you know, he would still be some kind kind of threat to her. But... If he passed away, so that he was no longer a concern or anything. Well, but you that let would the genie her... out of the bottle. You don't know. I mean, now that she knows she has the abilities, I don't think you can ever go back to where she was before psychologically. Wow. Yeah. Well, now we do have to go. Uh, Stephen, uh, if people want to get a hold of you, especially for your books, uh, how would they do that? Uh, 
Um, the easiest way, I have a university website whose address nobody would ever remember, but I have an easy-to-remember website. It's jazzphilosopher.com. Jazz Philosopher, that's right. That's right. I remember. Yeah. Yep. I remember that. So jazzphilosopher.com. Jazzphilosopher.com. All right, Dr. Stephen Br- or Yeah, you're still a doctor. Yes. yes. <laughs> that didn't oh, yeah. go away when you retired. <laughs> no, now I'm just emeritus professor. That's all. No. Newly retired, enjoying the rest of his life, Dr. Thank Stephen you. Browdy. Uh, thank you thank very you. much for your time. Uh, we thank are out of time, and uh, okay. we will talk to you again. Okay, bye-bye. All right, everybody, that's all the time we have for, for this week. Uh, next week's going to be another good one. We're really excited, and until then, don't be afraid, only believe. <laughs>